from Snake Island to sunflower seeds. Grant me a fraction of the bravery being shown by the Ukrainians fighting for their country. Just a fraction. You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Spanners Ready. You wanted cars on track? Well, you got them. Get all our thoughts on the first test. Who was reliable? Were the lap times important? Were there any issues and problems? We'll basically be looking at the new toys at the disposal of all the teams and drivers. Are the new regulations working for following? Well, we'll find out what the drivers had to say about that. We'll be learning about the difference between different types of suspension from our suspension expert, Kyle Power. And why were the cars bumping up and down? And are these even the cars that we're going to see in Bahrain? Or will there be B-spec Bahrain cars. I'm also going to bully my panel today into committing to saying which driver they are supporting in nine teammate battles in Formula One. Um, I am also joined by Matt Two Rumpets. Good morning, Matt. Good afternoon. I always forget. It's afternoon for you, sir. And how is it? It's going pretty well compared to the frigid wasteland we experienced the last two days. The frigid wasteland of rain and misery yeah yeah frozen precipitation and below zero temperatures which it was 22 and then it was minus three and snowing and now it's like you know 12 and just like we have no we have no seasons anymore just different weather every day that's the third show in a row i think you've spoken about weather we really have anglicized you haven't we matt yeah you pretty much have <laughs> okay. sorry before I Sorry, you, Americans, I'm letting down the side. Before I introduce you to the rest of the panel, let me remind you that we are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind permission of our better halves. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. <laughs> We're joined on the panel by engineer and suspension expert Kyle Power from a from a new slightly echo, echo, echoier office. Hello, Kyle. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I would like to preface this by saying I am not a suspension expert in any which way whatsoever. I just no. have a keen interest for the differences. I've been uh, monitoring the preparation WhatsApp chat. You seem like you know your stuff. And like all experts, always go, oh, I'm no expert. But I think you do understand it. So you can take us on a on a tour of your pulls and your pushes and your, your rods and your coils. Well, hopefully we can go on the pool together and maybe learn some stuff. All right. Well, I wasn't expecting that, but I'm in. Uh, we also have uh, my personal 24-hour on-call emergency vet, Chris Catman-Turner. That's a fair description of your most important role, surely. It is, although I'm a little bit disappointed this evening, Spanners, because no. when you asked me to come on the podcast and talk about porpoising, I had assumed you wanted my veterinary knowledge yes. rather than some engineering waffle. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, I have a special window lined up where we can just focus in on, on Matt and Kyle uh, and they can talk about a, a little bit of the engineering side of stuff. But uh, it has been F1 testing in Barcelona. I, I really think that's a fair description of it. So let's get into that. Dirty news. Okay, so Matt, we have had the first test in Barcelona. And as we all know with testing, lap times, as I've consistently said, lap times in testing are the absolute number one most important thing. And as we can see, Lewis Hamilton won testing. Yeah, well, uh, from from that measure, you've got to be very excited because Mercedes was top of the charts. They put the best lap times in. And if you're going to be concerned about a team that's not um, one of our problem children, which was um, the teams that really didn't get a lot of running in, that would be uh, Alpha and Haas, 
then then if you're an Alpine fan, you're a bit concerned because they did not get a lot of mileage in and they did not put in particularly fast times although there's a little asterisk there we can talk about in a bit if you like oh i see come on this is going to start it's starting already it's all about oh but it's about how many laps they did at 80 percent pace boring yeah that's it surely headline times are all we talk about <laughs> absolutely <laughs> what was your standout so far kyle from that that week in barcelona um i think it was the reliability of the top teams, the big thing seeing for me was the variation in design. Uh, the cars are wildly different and none of that was predicted. Um, and also quite a strong, encouraging sign that we saw from Mercedes on the first day was they were almost instantly backing off and spoiling laps to mask their pace, which I think is a sign of confidence. See, it's very, very hard, isn't it, Carl, to to resist looking at things like that and sector times. And and I think someone was putting together like optimal times as well, if you put together all the, the best sectors. And it's it's very hard as fans not to look into that. If not the headline times, the behaviour. Like, why are people lifting off? Yeah, there was even some comments. I think it was from Marco, who said uh, McLaren are off the sponsors. So he reckoned they may have been going for some glory runs, which, again, I find hard to believe. Well, you say hard to believe, but if we cast our minds back to 2014, just before the Williams-Martini deal, I think, they suddenly looked like they were top of testing. And I know they did end up finishing second or third that year, but they would really put out headline times. And I could be even thinking of 2013, I can't remember. Uh, but then suddenly the Williams, uh, the... Martini sponsorship came along and they settled back to their normal position. It's maybe not a massive exaggeration. Uh, Catman. Yeah, back in the day in the, in the 90s, teams like Prost used to run a completely illegal car with new illegal tyres, underweight and everything just to put the headline time in and say, look how amazing we are. And then get to the actual race and they're absolutely nowhere. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity, Matt, to, to beat you to the punch and say, Ferrari are looking really promising this year. It could be a title year for them. It could be. And yet, uh, it may not be. Um, confronted with a uh, war of the words from Toto Wolff um, about Ferrari looking like they were two to three months ahead of Mercedes, uh, I think Bonato replied, well, let's see the car they turn up with in Bahrain, and that'll probably be two to three months ahead of us. So I would be careful because I think we're going to see some big improvements between now and Bahrain. I think a lot of teams showed up with the minimum necessary to learn what they wanted to learn. Yeah, and there were positive signs for Ferrari on the power unit side. They've made quite a radical sort of change and a lot of change in the architecture in, in anticipation of the engine freezes. And it looks like it's going well. We haven't seen any speed trap data yet, but all of the murmurs from around the paddock is their power unit is looking quite strong and it didn't go bang. So that's another good thing. Yeah, in fact, they were at the top of the charts for mileage, which is which is where you'd like to be at the end of the first test. And and you're right, the general consensus is they are now on par with uh, Red Bull Honda and also on par with Mercedes in terms of their power unit, which means it's all going to come down to the exciting aerodynamic developments we're about to see. Ah, okay. So like Cole was saying, there is like a lot of differences and a lot of different approaches. The The Red Bull car looks very complex. So they've either done something very right or very wrong. Ferrari seem to be in, in that zone as well. And, and then, and even the cars that are saying they're conventional, it does look like everyone's got a different approach. In Bahrain, I guess we'll see maybe there's a little bit more alignment as, so, as it becomes obvious that you know, like a big scoop out of your AirPods, it doesn't really work. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, a lot of variation. Uh, yeah, a lot of variation. And and really, if we're talking about stuff that's interesting on the Red Bull, it's the back of the Red Bull right now that's very interesting. Their beam wing looks like nobody else's. And it was, um, I believe, Braun and Simmons down having a careful look at their rear suspension, which looks to be very trick indeed. Uh, okay, we'll get to we'll get to suspension um, in in a little while, but I think a, an interesting place to start with Matt uh, might be the the new regulations that were designed to help with following, and and that's probably crucial. That's a big thing fans are looking for. Did we get any insight into whether it's possible to follow better? Uh, well, actually, we did. Uh, we had a, a lovely quote from uh, Charles Leclerc. Charles Leclerc, 
I think Leclerc is the Monegasque pronunciation, but you know, I could also just be completely wrong about that, saying that um, it was better than last season, up to about a second, between a second and a half second behind, it was actually hard. And then on the other side of that, it was way easier than previous seasons to follow. So if you looked at the rooster tails, you could see the difference visually, less outwash, much higher plumes coming over the back of the cars. Those regulations are working from an aerodynamic point of view right now, because we don't know what toys are going to be brought to Bahrain. Right now, they're working the way they're supposed to, but with every silver lining comes a cloud. <laughs> okay. Yep, and that cloud will be the, the slipstreaming effect, won't it? So uh, the, if it kicks the, the airflow higher up into the air, you're likely to get less disturbance further back. And so down the straights, you have to be much closer to get a decent slipstreaming effect going on. And that's what some of the drivers have been saying, is they can follow effectively through the corners, but when they get to the straight, they're not going to breeze by like they used to. Okay, but that's that's fine. I'd rather have cars being able to naturally get close. And, and that means if you if you do better through a corner, you're going to be closer anyway. So we don't need the slipstream effect as much, maybe, Matt. Yeah, well, I think the idea behind the regulations, um, and there was a Russell quote that I'll share in just a second that I think illustrates it. I think the idea behind the regulations was to make it easier to follow in corners. Therefore, the overtakes are going to be happening in a different place now. And so oh. when Russell talked about this, and he's the one who brought it up, he said, you need the delta on the straight because you can only really overtake at the end of the straight into the corner. Now, I'm thinking to last season, and I'm thinking we saw lots of overtakes that weren't necessarily at the end of the DRS straight into turn one. And I think what the FIA is wanting is for, for the DRS to basically get you within a second, within half a second, going into turn one. And now you're going to have to make that overtake on the twisty bits, whereas before it was just uh, almost a push to pass 70% of the time. Yeah, agree. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see how, how different it is. As you say, um, this might actually suit the more Verstappen style, massive launch on the brake style, because there's the cars are heavier now, so the braking zones are going to be naturally slightly, slightly longer. So it's going to facilitate more heavy, deep braking. And if they can't, if the slipstream's not so, not so fierce, then yeah, we could see interesting parts of like circuits that we don't usually see used for overtaking. Like, um, like I'm thinking we might see more lunges in the final sector at Barcelona, for instance. The cars are heavier, but they can follow a bit easier. It's yeah. going to be fascinating to see how that plays out. Okay, so one suggested place that I can think of off the top of my head is like a sweeping, the sweeping right-hander at Suzuka at the start. So, you know, you, that was, is, I think, is it is it flat unless you're following something like that, which then now might make the, the first right-hander into the S's uh, an overtaking zone. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but uh, make places like Shanghai, where you've got the very twisty uh, losing downforce as you slow down and lose grip and rear end, you know, all these places might suddenly become places to start following. Or am I being too optimistic? Am I getting carried away? <laughs> I think I might be getting carried away, Kyle. Yeah, there was a slight little counteract to the um, reduction in the slipstream effect with Bottas come out and actually said that um, the DRS is more powerful now. They have a lot bigger opening in the rear wing. So what we what's negated by the slipstream effect being lost is actually gained back with with the drs being a lot more powerful so it'd be interesting to see if they feel the need to alter the drs distances on the tracks traditionally from what we've seen before because last year at some tracks if you got drs it was almost a guaranteed pass they'll just blast past people and as matt says i don't think we're going to be seeing any of that so it's good that they've kept the drs because i do still think it's going to be a necessary evil i'm afraid Maybe though, Carl, maybe they could be more dynamic with the DRS. So go into a weekend with a plan, but if it's if it's too overpowered, have the powers to say, oh, no, it was too late to work that into the regs now. But if you had like scales of DRS that you were allowed, no, three DRS flaps <laughs> so that you can go, right, um, we, we said you could open all three, but now it's only a one DRS flap in, in zone one. Uh, it's too complicated, I know, but some, uh, some adaptability. Yeah, there is a way. So they could just basically, you could see them over the weekend after seeing the data from Friday practice, just adjusting the length of the DRS zones. 
So if it's too powerful, they'll trim it back. If it's not powerful enough, they'll ah. give it more. I would imagine they'll set them with a margin of error either way. Oh, I feel so stupid, Kyle. That's, <laughs> of course, that's a much easier way to adjust how powerful DRS is. Just move the line. <laughs> I'm like, no, engineer a, a Gillette razor type set of flags. Uh, Catman then, Matt. I was going to say it's a shame that we still have the DRS because I thought uh, one of the main points of trying to get the cars closer to follow each other is the fact that we could stop relying on this silly push to pass system. But as I say, if it's less powerful and actually gives a, an opportunity to overtake that isn't a gimme, then I'm all for it still. OK, but they might uh, you know, go to Bahrain and, and then start getting into the European season and, and start going, oh, hang on a minute, guys, all the tracks we've gone to, the DRS has been well overpowered. Actually, let's experiment with just having no DRS now in uh, Monaco, which, as Stuart Neal points out in the live chat, will now be a festival of overtaking. But, you know, they could get to some tracks and go, do you know what? This has been a good track for overtaking anyway. Let, let's experiment and see if we, we just maybe don't need DRS. Uh, Matt? Yeah, well, we're having a, a bit of a conversation about this. It would be great to get rid of DRS or to, you know, I, I, I like Summer's idea of giving 100 DRS pushes a race. Use them as you like, whenever you like. But what we're going to see in reality, in my opinion, is DRS being used differently, not to overtake, but to close that bit of the hard gap that Leclerc was referencing when he was talking about following cars, because there is there is sort of this between about a second and a half a second where it's more difficult to follow. And that's what DRS is going to be used for now, not so much just for the straight overtakes. But as long as they can keep fighting through corners and you don't see tire, uh, cars just having to back off to stay out of the aero zone because they're losing grip and that's scrubbing tires. That's one of the most depressing things is when you've got a car on the attack for a few laps and they go, oh, I can't get too close because that's just doing my tires in now. There is some positive news on that front as well. I can't remember where I saw it, but apparently these new tires, Pirelli were given a brief, like a performance brief saying, look, the drivers have to be able to push these tires, push them really hard and then back off and they'll come back to them. The problem with the last tires were, particularly with thermal degradation, is you push them hard, you get them hot, and they don't really come back to you, and you just disproportionately wear your tires. So apparently these new tires of the drivers were asked to go for some really push laps, back off, trying to get the tires back, and there was a lot of positive comments apparently coming back, so that might help solve it. All right. Okay. Matt, I think we'll go into some of the specifics, but it's worth just looking at the, the testing table. Yes, I was joking that lap times are the most important thing, but my pre-testing prediction was that things would be broadly the same. So my kind of predicted order was you, you'd have Mercedes and Red Bull still fighting. I feel like Mercedes, from, from everything we've heard, Mercedes really went like all in on the 2022 car, but, but Red Bull, by the same measure, we were getting reports mid-season that they'd left a skeleton crew on the aero upgrades for, for the upcoming races. That doesn't mean like things like engines and, and, uh, and strategy and, and uh, I don't know, the odd suspension part wasn't being changed, but they also moved their focus onto 2022 as, as well, Catman. But I can't see the Braun era 2008 car appearing out of nowhere. And the testing times from what you can glean and what you can see and people lifting off. And it, it all just kind of feels like, yeah, it's broadly where we were before. I can't see a big surprise. Yeah, and those teams, don't forget, that were still working on their 2021 cars right to the end. They won't have just unlearned all that knowledge they learned yeah. from it. So there will be, even though I think it was over 95% of the cars are brand new, a lot of the knowledge and theory and all that sort of stuff will be applicable to their new machines if tweaked a little bit. <laughs> Matt? Well, I want to mention some standouts um, because as always, it's not how much I develop my car, it's how much I develop my car relative to my competitors. And I think broadly speaking, you're right. I think Mercedes and Red Bull will still be at the top, but I think there may have been one or two teams that might have made a bit of a step relative to them. Ferrari being the obvious one that we've sort of already mentioned. Every I think Ferrari year, Matt, will... every year. God, Ferrari are going to what? They're going to win the championship. I think they're going to be closer. I, I, think they, I think they will be in there. And the other team that I would mention at the top of the tables, I think would be uh, McLaren. Because I, I, 
looks to me they've done some very interesting stuff. And when yeah. I say me, I mean, you know, I talked to Summers and that's what he said. No, no, pretend it was you. The, okay, the, me. Yeah, he's not in the live chat or anything. He's there. not in the live chat or anything it's poo-pooing not, yeah. our DRS talk. Uh, yeah, so look, um, I will poo-poo the Ferrari thing. I, I think they're going to be behind McLaren. McLaren seemed actively upset to have topped the tables. Really interesting comment from Lando Norris going, oh, no, we're at the top of the table now. Everyone's going to start you know, talking and bigging up our chances. So we shouldn't do that again. And then Ricciardo goes and does it the the next day and, and tops the tables again as well. Uh, with Ferrari, I, I do believe, and I would love someone to confirm or deny this, anyone who's been in and around Marinella, I do feel like there's a some kind of morale need or some kind of management requirement to look good and impress in testing. Because of all the teams... They are the team that seem to overperform in testing and in Friday practice. And they, whilst everybody else is some sandbagging, I just get this feeling that if they look bad in testing or look bad on a Friday, people start to ask questions. And so that's just, that's my outside impression of Ferrari. I, I bet it's not quite like the Mercedes no blame culture. I think it's more like, hey, why are we eighth in the testing table this with Ferrari? There's always an element of um, sort of political aspect to it yeah. and pressure from Ferrari that they have to do. And remember back to 2019, they were looking awesome in testing yeah, and very they turned up yeah. to Australia and, well, they didn't turn up. They were nowhere. And I remember Vettel on the radio saying, why are we so slow? Subsequently, they might have had a slightly wonky engine, but they were they, they pretty much dominated testing and then were nowhere at the first race. Yeah, well, they did look good in 2019, didn't they? They had some extra fuel in their fire. Allegedly. Okay. Allegedly. Okay. Okay, Matt. So why don't we talk about some of... The... Oh, go on. You tell me. Well, I was going to say, uh, because it's come up uh, a bit in the chat too, uh, one of the teams that looked particularly not great was Alpine. And, and this was a bit of a shock, but there, as I mentioned earlier, is a bit of an asterisk there. They have a brand new power unit. They've split their turbo and compressor. They've gone for an exhaust solution that I think is sort of midway between um, the Ferrari and Mercedes exhaust solution. But what they didn't do is, one, they didn't ever use DRS uh, the whole time they were at Barcelona, which makes me a little suspect, but is they say is worth about seven-tenths uh, in terms of lap time. And the other thing they did do was they ran with extra fuel on board, and they I'm betting because it's a brand new power unit, they probably didn't explore the upper reaches of their engine maps, like maybe some of the other teams with uh, more mature and developed designs may have. One theory why they didn't use their DRS was because the DRS, I know we'll get onto porpoising later, but the DRS would actually make the porpoising uh, less of a problem. And I know that Alpine was struggling with it, one of the the more of all the teams so actually maybe they realized that they had an issue and opening drs might mask it ah you are like you're a vet so you must be our porpoising expert as as you oh, yeah. mentioned okay so what do you know about this porpoising effect where it looked like uh, they were in those suspension rocking cars that you see in r&b music videos it, it it looked quite harsh on the driver's necks yeah, it, uh, it looked quite severe. The, the the bouncing up and down as they go towards the end of those straights, particularly when they're reaching kind of 250 to 300 kilometers an hour, look pretty savage. Um, so, yeah, it's, shall I explain what porpoising yeah, is and how please. that works? Yes, please. Cool. Go for it. Okay. So, um, porpoising then. So, so, basically, as you're driving along, these new cars have got a lot more of their downforce generated from the undersurfaces of the car or from the floor rather than from the top surfaces. You know, last year they had yeah. lots of these trick winglets and barge boards and things that would make a lot of downforce. So so this is the, the famous ground effect that people have been calling for for, for, for for decades. Absolutely. So the theory is if you make your downforce from underneath the car rather than on top of the car, you're going to be able to control the outwash a little bit better and allow the cars to follow more closely, which is exactly what we were talking about we want them to be able yeah. to do. But but the issue is, is that as the car gets faster, particularly, as I say, over 250 kilometers an hour, what happens is the car gets that downforce generated under the car, sucks it onto the floor of the uh, of the car onto the actual ground. 
And what happens is then the airflow underneath the car, I'm sure trumpets can explain this bit a little bit better, but it stalls because you get a, a pressure gradient, a pressure difference that means that it can't go through as fast as it's being put out the back. Uh-huh. And so when it stalls, they're not generating the downforce, then the back of the car rises up. <laughs> and then, could... of course, it can then re-engage and then suck itself back down. So it starts porpoising, you know, the classic porpoise or oh dolphin. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound ideal. So I can, I can see people, Kyle. I mean, this is where we come onto your field of expertise, which is suspension. Have uh, I heard reports that the, they basically underestimated this effect and, and the suspension is, is not up to stopping it. It's too floppy. Oh, yeah. And they couldn't test for it in the wind tunnels. They couldn't test for it or get the models close enough to a ground to really simulate this. So it's caught everyone a little bit off guard. The FIA did offer a solution um, when they were writing the rules saying they could turn up the end. I think I think it's about 25 millimeters of the floor and all the teams rejected it because they are too far along in their development. And obviously it's going to cost them performance. So one of the fixes, which is what um, Alpha was suffering terribly from it, um, Alfa Romeo, and they they raise the ride height. But of course, if you're raising ride height, you're giving away performance in other areas. But some teams will struggle with it more than others because if it gets just right, and as Catman was saying, when it stalls and it goes up, it gets into this this frequency and it's kind of like a harmonic and it's this frequency going. So it's a combination of sort of chassis, tyre stiffness and suspension kinematics, which is all going to um, play together. And some teams were better than others, not necessarily by design. It might just be a bit of luck, really, that some teams are suffering with it less than others. Yeah, well, you you mentioned the modeling, and that's interesting because I, I had had a conversation with Summers earlier, and he had wondered if perhaps testing only with mule cars running last year's suspension and aerodynamics might not induce some problems for the teams and for Pirelli in terms of dealing with the tires. And lo and behold, here we are with James Key talking about sidewall stiffness and natural resonance. It's not a surprise that some of these things turn up. But it's also not a surprise that it's as bad as it, bad as it is because um, the teams have not brought their final, their optimal solutions to the floor. For example, if we look at McLaren, they didn't have a big problem. They have this lovely uh, uh, slot uh, at the back of their floor that bleeds some of that pressure off as the floor gets closer and closer to the surface of the track and keeps that porpoising from happening happening or so it's being theorized that's an easy solution to copy even in a budget cap world so it's likely that the problems will be less i agree and actually i think ferrari came up with a very similar concept with that longitudinal slot in their floor just to just in front of the rear wheels and they brought that i think on the second day of the test and they were another one or the third day of the test sorry and it wasn't the um uh, it, it made it so that they weren't struggling as much with the problems as, as the others were. Yeah, and interestingly, uh, again, going back to James Key talking about this, he mentioned that they brought, they added, they brought some new aero developments in day two that made it worse. So the fact that they started with a car that didn't really have this problem, and then they added things that caused it, has, has sort of short, shortened their journey to fully understanding what's going on here. Although he admits they weren't clever enough to know in advance. They just mm. got lucky with the direction they chose to go with their uh, design and setup. So I'm wondering, Kyle, if this if there's going to be almost like a tactical element to this, because if you, I guess, if you've got a driver that can stand it and it's not affecting your braking too much, you you might have teams that are going right. If you don't mind a bit of a headache, we can get an extra tenth at this track in particular. Or this track's bumpy anyway, so just deal with it. Quite possibly, and we could see this varying between teams team to team depending mm. on what track and what yeah. tire compounds are brought as well because the tire wall stiffness actually has a has a has a big part to play in it so if there's a softer tire it might have less rigidity in the That's tire wall true. stiffness and then that will cause it at some tracks but not others uh, uh, so, so just a quick question can you change ride heights between tracks that's something just part yeah. of your normal setup oh God, yes there could be some tactics there but yeah it's going to be this trade-off of the lo- they want to be as low as they can really they want to go as low as they can. So that's what the Salva said. They said they raised the ride height, but they were losing performance, but it got rid of the porpoising, which actually caused them some damage on the first day. Um, <laughs> actually broke the gearbox, I think. 
Yeah, it certainly did. And, and other solutions that other teams have had. So I don't know if you've seen uh, Mercedes had this little silver brace that they put between the chassis and the edge of the floor to make sure as, as the car was going faster, it wasn't flexing and sucking it down, making the effect worse. And um, also Alpine, they uh, took a hacksaw to the back of their floor to, uh, just in front of the rear wheel to try and see if they could carve a huge chunk out of it to stop that from happening as well oh that feels like f1 that feels like proper engineering carl as soon as they start getting the hacksaws out and just like cutting bits of bodywork i'm all in hacksaws arrow diet and gaffer tape that's the one buddy. just about everything oh, hang on, that. Ex- except that bit's not moving so wd40 now we're yeah. sorted well now you mentioned moving and uh and and chris mentioned the f word as well so flexi the mclaren flap and solution to it it looks awfully flimsy and it looks like it could flex quite a lot in certain situations. So the cure to this porpoising and putting these little flaps and slots in the, in the floor, we're with our old, good old friend, flexi body parts problems. So the McLaren does, that does look open to abuse. So I imagine lots of teams are going to be watching and trying mm-hmm. to get spy shots of it and see how much it's flexing. So there's going to be a whole nother flexi can of worms open this year, I think. Yeah. And so I think the last real testing tech type issue I'd, I'd like to talk about, it's probably aimed at, at Matt and Kyle a bit more, is uh, we hear a lot about pull rod and push rod suspension. And as far as I can tell, one of them, the teams always try it and it never goes well. Is there is there is there such a thing, Kyle, as a quick primer primer on what is the difference between pull and push rod? Is pull rod the one that teams have tried in the past to little success? And and it seems like Red Bull are going for it, which makes some people happy and oh any innovation from Red Bull and other people going, Ooh, maybe this makes them a midfield car. Yes. So in a nutshell, we have we have six teams that are basically going to be traditional, what are called traditional. So back in 2009 with the regulation changes, Newey kind of reintroduced pull rod at the rear, which basically means instead of there being like a 45 degree suspension bar going to the top of like the gearbox casing, and as the tire hits a bump, it gets pushed up and it will push on the rockers and the suspension system, that's a push rod. He flipped it over the other way. So you can mount it lower. So when the tire gets pushed up, it actually pulls on the suspension system so push rod pull rod traditionally since 2009 everyone's pretty much ran a pull rod at the rear and push rod at the front that's been tradition apart from notable cases of mclaren in 2013 they tried a pull rod on the front and if those of you with good memories will remember jensen button going mad in first free practice at australia saying the ride was horrible um it's a bit more difficult to engineer mechanically mclaren got it wrong in 2013 and reverted straight back uh, in 2012, Ferrari and that much unloved Ferrari that Alonso dragged into the title fight, uh, they went for pull rod and they stuck with it for a couple of years. But apart from them too, traditionally, everyone has got push rod on the front and pull rod on the rear, apart from this year. So we've got six traditional teams that have actually done it. And we've got a few major outliers. Okay. McLaren and Red Bull have completely flipped it on its head. They've gone for pull rod at the front and push rod on the rear. So it's the first time we're kind of seeing these wild variations and we've got alpha the the alphas alpha romeo and alpha tori have gone both gone for push push which i don't think we've seen for an awful long time in f1 so it's fascinating to see the different variations but you would think that changing this is mainly a mechanical thing it's trying to get more mechanical grip but it's not it's mainly an aero issue to try and get the suspension furniture we'll call it the suspension arms in a more favorable place to direct air. So they're using the suspension arms to try to shape the air and get it into the Venturi tunnels at the front. So if you do a pull rod, it's mounted lower and at a less extreme angle. You have a push rod, you've got a more extreme angle bar in the way. So this is why they're doing it, but we've seen completely different aero concepts all going different ways with it at all. So it's fascinating to see the difference. Uh, okay, uh, agree. I'll take your word for it. That that's fascinating, but Trump is... <laughs> Oh, it is fascinating is it? because of course okay. the push rod being in tension versus the pull rod being in traction and the fact that they've changed the regulations so that one of the big advantages of push rod at the front was that it was easily adjustable because there was spare room in, in the chassis. You could just pull off the panel and adjust the rockers and the bars the way you wanted to. Whereas now those things, if you look at where they're mounted, the the push rod teams up at the top, they look like they barely can fit them in. The pull rod gives the aerodynamic advantage a bit of a weight advantage, but also, and certainly I believe this may be the case uh, for Alpha Towering, 
It may give a bit of a cost advantage as well because AlphaTauri is having to buy current generation Red Bull parts for their car. And it turns out that they've been in the habit of buying stuff that was one or maybe two years old and updating their design after Red Bull was much less expensive for them. So it may have been a cost decision on the part of AlphaTauri to split from the uh, parent team in terms of their front end design. Yeah, that's really interesting because as you say, they can essentially buy and get the Red Bull rear end and bolt it on. But what's really interesting is, yeah, they've done the opposite to Red Bull at the front. So a similar situation with Alfa Romeo, which I found really, really interesting, was that they essentially get the Ferrari back end. So they could have the Ferrari gearbox and the engine. And of course, Ferrari are using a pull rod at the rear end. But Alfa Romeo wanted a push rod at the rear end. So they've had to rework the casing and obviously spend a bit of money in development there because they really, really wanted a push rod. So it's just, it's incredible that they have this option there open to them and they haven't taken it and decided to go against it and probably cost themselves a bit more expense to design their own casings just because they want this push rod. So they're obviously seeing a massive advantage it's going to give them. But it's interesting to see how the mechanics of it are going to play out on track oh, because uh, traditionally with pull rod front yeah. suspension, as Spanners mentioned, it usually goes a bit wrong and the ride's a bit nasty. Okay, so who are the teams? Just remind me, who's going for this one that hasn't worked in the past and could be a bit nasty? Who's who's gambling it all? McLaren, Red Bull? McLaren, Red Bull are gone completely flipped. So they're, right. they're, they're pull rod on the front and push rod on the rear. Alpha Tauri and um and Alpha Romeo have both gone for a push push combination, okay. which is which is really strange. And the rest of them, so we've got Mercedes, Ferrari, Aston, Williams, Alpine, and Haas yeah. have all gone for the traditional oh, okay. push on the front. Okay, the so rear. so the main risk there seems to be for McLaren or Red Bull because I'm I'm split because I really like one of those teams and I don't like one of the other teams. I'm not going to tell you which one I like and which one I don't like though. You know, I was talking about the regulations before we move on. I just wanted to mention they took away a lot of the other advantages of the push rod at the front as well, being able to attach it to the upright. So a lot of the ride height tricks that would have actually helped with the porpoising that we're seeing now, and also with the slow speed maneuvering, have been taken away from the teams. And this is maybe why you see Red Bull and McLaren interested in uh, experimenting again, because there's going to be less difference between the, between the two types of suspension with this new regulation set. Okay, let's talk about the drivers. A Formula One team is a team of hundreds of people, a cohesive unit working together with technical excellence, team spirit and drive, moving forward as one unit for engineering and motorsport glory, all except for the, the two steering wheel seat interfaces, the drivers, who in reality are playing a career game in Formula One. As nice as uh, people might be, as much banter as there might be between Ricardo and, and Lando Norris, there is a competitive drive. Only one person on that grid has exactly the same machinery as you. It is your job to make yourself the number one driver so that the team backs you. You want to get to the point in the season from the start or at some point halfway through where the team is telling your teammate to get out of your way because you're on a different strategy. You want to get to the point where if they make a technological uh, design decision, they make it with you in mind, especially for the next season. And you want to make it so that if one of the top teams is looking for a driver, it's you and not your teammate that they're looking for. I want all my panel here to go through the teams and I want to know who they are supporting. Not who you think you're going to win, but who you're backing and why. Uh, and I want this. I want this on the record. So let's have the scribe take a note of these so there's no going back. Why don't we start at McLaren? Hmm. Catman, who are you supporting? And, and this is not who do you think will win. It's who you're gunning for. Who, If you had to wear the colours of one of those and a number on your cap, Ricardo Lando Norris. I'm really sad that you're making me choose between the two. <laughs> I know what I'm doing, man. Okay, like I know content. Choose, you must. I can't sit on the fence, so I'm going to go, no. obviously, for Lando, because I love both of them. But Lando is just a phenomenal talent. He's a really nice guy, but he's he's developing so much, and he's on a massively upward trajectory. He's got 
stability in that he's got his contract sorted for the next four or five years or something crazy. So, you know, the, the guy's only got room to grow and I, I think he's going to, he's phenomenal. Oh, that's so interesting. I'm, I'm actively for the first time in a long time supporting Daniel Ricardo in the driver battles this year. And everything you're saying about Lando Norris is absolutely true. Um, and whilst I maintain that there is potential for Ricardo to become a, a super villain of some kind, like you give him access to a, a large amount of troops and a super volcano. And we just, we don't know what he would do. That's all I'm saying. But he, I think he has shown some real resilience in the face of a very stern challenge in a, a Lando Norris that is extant in that team and that it's Lando Norris's team in a, a car regulation year where all the drivers that switched to a new car struggled. And the way he's dealt with that has been so admirable that I'm, I'm, I'm gunning for Ricardo because I don't think the gap between him and Lando Norris is as big as it looked last season. And I kind of want to see that redressed a little bit. And I also think, I think people got a tiny bit carried away on the Norris train last season. So I, I'm backing Ricardo to close that gap. Absolutely. And I think he could well do it because the, the guy's got a lot of talent. Don't forget, this guy went up against Max Verstappen and was comparing very, very favorably towards him. He got a lot of wins in the same seat as him. So I, I really love Ricardo. I think he'll do well this year. He'll be closer. Not necessarily ahead, but closer. Who are you supporting, Kyle? Well, I see there's a lot of uh, digs online about us Brits being a bit too... No. too patriotic and just going for the British people all the time. So I'm cheering on Ricardo this year. Uh, I I really, really like Norris. He's a very, seems a very nice chap, uh, but his due a wobble, his due a wobble season now, like the most people get in, get established. He's got his long-term contract. He might nail a few more pizzas, let himself go a bit, have a bit of a wobble season, like a Hamilton 2011 season. <laughs> yeah. And Ricardo now is used to the car. So I'm rooting for Ricardo to get on top of Norris because also, we want to see Ricardo stay in the sport. If he gets trounced this season, it's not good for him. And I think everybody is a bit of a closet Dan Ricardo fan. Um, so yeah, he is he is he is my route. I think Norris is going to have a wobble and Ricardo, that smile will come shining through. Absolutely. And if he doesn't, then as you said, um, he's going to have a lot of young guns at his seat, particularly Pato Award from IndyCar, who's driving for the McLaren SP team. He could, uh, there's no bones about that. They want to bring him across. And they said, if it doesn't happen in the next couple of years, it won't happen at all. Well, that's conveniently when Dan Ricardo's uh, contract runs out. <laughs> but this is the key thing for me, Matt, is Norris getting that contract must have stung a little bit for Ricardo because it sort of feels like you're removing any chance of me usurping him. It probably isn't that. It's probably much more to do with retention and contract negotiations. But that, that must have just hurt a little bit. Yeah, it would. And I'm sure he and his massive bank account from skipping teams so many times <laughs> yeah. is just, just crying by themselves alone in a corner. Look, Ricardo's uh, the older of the two drivers. Norris was clearly established as being the future of McLaren. I, I'm i with Catman. I think Norris, I know we're not talking about who's going to win. I think Norris is more likely to win of the two of them just because he's been in the team longer and has been bedded in longer. But this change in regulations is just fascinating to me. And I, I, Ricardo may have an advantage that we just can't see yet. Okay, let's move on to what might be uh, a slightly simpler one. I don't know. Uh, let's go to Aston Martin. And it's who you're cheering for on this team. Firstly, have we got anybody on the panel who looks at that driver lineup and goes, do you know what, I'm hoping Lance Stroll really you know, sends one to, to Vettel. Kyle? Yep. Again, oh, Vettel. God. I like Vettel. I really, really like him. And but he's been getting a bit too much praise. He's become a bit too much of the golden <laughs> shining boy of Formula One. He's been clearing everyone's rubbish up. He's probably <laughs> been he's probably been serving glasses of champagne and canapes on the way into the paddock. Everyone loves him at the moment. Yeah. And I think St Stroll has got himself nice and you know he put in some good performances last year. And so this year I'm rooting for. I'm rooting for Stroll to become the new the new golden boy. Oh my god, that's horrible, Catman. Oh, I'm feeling a bit sick. <laughs> oh no, <can> I, <laughs> you, I, I, I appreciate what you did with the improv there, but you, you went too far the other way. But <laughs> you'll be supporting Vettel in that teammate battle. Yeah, I, I I like 
Vettel for all the reasons that Kyle doesn't seem to like him. I think he's a you know a very interesting guy who who seems to, as you say, clear everybody's rubbish. And I think he's going to clear the floor with Lance this year. Yeah, and and obviously, like, I you know that I've got that that working class uh, several chips on both shoulders uh, about Lance Stroll. I freely admit that, but I would I would like to see. I'm 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 hoping Vettel will win and buy a lot because for me, I am impressed with actually with how Lance Stroll has taken this unprecedented uh, length of opportunity that you would get whilst being probably not at the very top level. And and as well, he's he's coming across much better as well than the driver in his second or third season that, that didn't look like he wanted to be there. He looks much more mature. He looks like he wants to be there. And the performance is edging towards where you would want a solid you know, midfield driver on the grid. But Sebastian Vettel is a four-time world champion. He's, he is better than Lance Stroll. I, like, I, nothing in my bones can convince me otherwise. And I, I want to see that gap reflected properly, which is which is why I would be cheering on Vettel for his results uh, this season. Catman? Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. I think uh, Stroll is a very solid number two. Yeah, I, yeah. And if that was his role, if that was all the ambition and you said, okay, he's a solid... If you're going to now have a pay driver... To, to support your push for the world championship. Actually, Lance Stroll bringing in a lot of money and performing solidly, not going and crashing into people, not being in, being in his car all the time, it, he would probably be a good choice for a number two driver at a midfield team that needs funding. H- however, that's not the case. And I, I get this suspicion that, that Vettel might suffer because there's an ambition right at the top of the team to see Lance Stroll do well, and that would that would hurt me, and it, it hurts the sporting element in my in my bones. Uh, but Kyle, Kyle just wants wants all of that turned on his head. He doesn't care about the sport. Never have. Never <laughs> Never. I want I want controversy. You want controversy <laughs> That's what I want. and motorbikes. That's all you care about, Kyle. That's all you care about. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on uh, down or up and down the grid. It's a bit of a random order. It's just the order I tweeted it in. To be honest, um, let's look at Alpha Tauri. Let's go to to you, Matt. Uh, Gasly versus Yuki Tsunoda. Who are you cheering for? Not who do you think is going to win? I'm cheering for Tsunoda. I yeah. want him to succeed Correct. so badly, and he showed such flashes at the end of last season. Like he was genuinely pushing Gasly, and he had some superior performances. If if he can get his head all the way together then then I am absolutely looking forward to him making Gasly sweat more than a little bit this season. Any any Gasly fans? Oh no, it was you, wasn't it, Catman? You're the, you upset Ellen, didn't you, by saying Gasly was overrated? Yeah, yeah, that didn't go so well for me last time. People were genuinely calling for you to never be on the podcast again. I got people going, You need to you need to drop him from the panel. He's a disgrace. It was hilarious. Yeah, they wanted my head on a stake. Yeah, you were um, briefly less <laughs> popular than brad philpot in uh in in the <laughs> netherlands <laughs> oh very very briefly <laughs> no i i i think gasly is a good driver i think he's very good but he's a he's a solid midfield driver and i'm gonna leave it there because i've said everything <laughs> i need to say yeah the live chat's already yeah don't read it don't read it catman kyle um to try to save some honor and save me getting hate mail because i haven't managed to get any yet no um, i'm gonna i'm gonna go gasly you're going so, to go Gasly. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, I just really, really like him. Um, I do like Sonoda, but I really like Gasly. And I'd like to see him maybe work towards the Red Bull main team again to have a second shot at it. So I'm okay. cheering on him to th- this year. I'm cheering on Sonoda as well. Uh, Pete Shilcock has made a great comment, which with it, with Sonoda, it's a head thing. Like you can't drive 110%. Plus, I think he came into a team with, with challenges. It looks like he was kind of just you know brought halfway across the world uh, not a great grasp on english into a brand new series as we've said before in a season where all the new drivers in new cars did struggle and so i do i want to see how that comes together because didn't they put him directly under franz tot's wing and and that wasn't all about a driving thing that was a that was a human element that they were solving there and it'd be interesting to see did did they did they get anywhere did they did they solve it It'd be interesting to see because he was extremely hot headed yeah. last year, like extremely hot headed. And they moved him to Italy so he could be under the watchful eye and probably gave him some guidance. And uh, 
and yeah, so maybe some slight sedatives in his drink before the race to try to calm him down, especially yeah. in practice sessions, because he was very, um, his attitude got the better of him and let him down a little bit. So yeah, if he sorts that out, we know he's got the pace. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. Yeah, he was a little bit sweary, wasn't he? But it was, it's good to see that actually Franz Tost commented that he was incredibly impressed by his approach to testing this year. So hopefully some of those lessons have sunk in. Yeah, at that age, learning to live in that hothouse environment and being deprived of, as most drivers are not, being deprived of all of your family and friends that normally would sort of help help you talk through and work through stuff is a massive challenge. And and props to Alpha Tauri for recognizing that and taking steps to head it off before it, it really um, became untenable for all the parties involved. And yeah, looking at testing, uh, maybe maybe we'll get the Yuki Tsunoda we deserve this season. Okay, well that would be certainly good to see at least to see that these these come closer. Uh, so this is fun so far. I'm enjoying doing this, and we've got six teams left to cover. We're going to go to uh, Williams. Um, this is the order I'm going to go in here because Catman's a big Williams fan. I know Matt is an Albon fan as well, and then we'll see what Carl thinks. So, uh, Catman, interesting season. For, for your team. And I have to say, you know, if you go back far enough, my team as well. And, you know, firstly, optimistic for the season? Um, they have a very interesting looking car, very 90 Simtech vibes, which is a fantastic thing to see. I've not seen an awful lot in terms of pace from it yet. But then, obviously, as we just said, we can't really read anything into the testing times. So, again, solid midfield. That's where I'm going to bet they're going to be. Okay. They'll be closer than they were before. You know, they're not going to be battling Haas, I don't think. I think Haas will be by themselves at the back. Okay. So which of those two drivers, those Williams drivers, will you be supporting next season? Like, who are you willing? Who are you willing on? Well, contrary to my previous standpoint on Alex Albon, I thought, you know, when I was very vocal about him being in the Red Bull and, and uh, that he basically couldn't keep it, anywhere near Vax Verstappen. I think he's going to be a, a good thing for Williams. You know, he's got experience of how a top team operates and hopefully that will, it, it not necessarily with his driving, but hopefully with his approach might be able to turn things around. Yeah, I think hmm, Latifi is a good, solid driver. He's a very likable person. He got a lot of stick he did not deserve. Um, last season but i think albon's gonna crush him like a grape and and i'm rooting for albon because he got he really got the wrong end of the stick at red bull because he his car was often two or three two or three generations behind the parts that verstappen had on his car it was never the kind of fair comparison that we see in other teams so i'm rooting for albon but i'm really rooting for the Williams side pods, because no one has designed anything that looks like that. And their move to the center line cooling is utter genius. So I want those side pods to succeed more than anything else. <laughs> Come on. I, th I think we need to uh, have a little thesaurus game going on here. So we're saying the word solid an awful lot when we actually mean terrible. Is that right? <laughs> I so, think that's where... <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's a euphemism and there's a few drivers that fit into that, that bracket because, you know, we are stuck with the, the billionaires club. And, and and so Stroll at least is not one of the nepotism hires or or uh, paid drivers that is is causing trouble. And Latifi definitely falls into that as well. And so for me, Kyle, it really does come down to like a personality thing. I don't know why, but I I don't like Alex Albon. I've never been a fan of his little things like the first time he got a podium. He, the, what his first comment was, he complained about the trophy. I'm like, just got your first podium in Formula One, dude. Whereas with Latifi, you, yeah, there's no sense of entitlement. You wouldn't know that he was a pay driver necessarily. So, that, so personally, in that battle, I find myself gunning for for Nicholas Latifi. I I agree with you there. Um, I do think there is a slight sense of entitlement with Albon when you've seen some of the behind the scenes stuff, like when it's just stuff the car and is in the garage. It's not like Oh, I'm sorry to the guys. He's just walked straight past, stands there talking to the bosses and stuff like that and seems pretty, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, whatever about it. Um, but I do like him. I like some of his interviews. Um, so I am actually going to be rooting for him this year on much the same reasons as what Matt said. 
because yeah, he never really got a fair crack at the whip in, in the main team at Red Bull. He was behind on development and thrust straight into it. And I still think he didn't do that bad a job, to be honest. So um, I think he's going to be, yeah, I want to see him get in, establish himself again and give himself another chance that I do think he deserves. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on then. I'm on my own. I'm on my own in a few of, of, of these. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be, I wasn't trying to be one of those people who were contrarians. I wasn't trying to be one of those people who says, oh, I don't even own jeans. I don't even have a TV. All my furniture just just points at the people because I like to engage on them on a personal level. I wasn't trying to do that. I'm trying to be difficult. Uh, let's go to uh, where is where's Bottas? Alpha Alpha Romeo. It's still called Alpha Romeo. Salba. Salba, Matt. That's where we're going. Who are you supporting at Salba? Well, based on their lack of testing miles, I think Alpha is a good name for them. But uh, that's just me. And can, can we say Alpha Romeo came out with that testing livery, didn't they? The camo thing yeah the uh we haven't signed all our sponsors yet livery i don't know yeah nice try no one's copying you alpha romeo like good i I get it but you know kyle it was super super sneaky because they chose a double layer of camo by hardly running the car and just staying in the garage as well so they they had a double layer of stealth i wish they had just turned all the black stripes red and had that as their livery that would have been (laughs) <laughs> Super cool, but we're never going to get that, are we? Driver's trumpets. So we've got Valtteri Bottas, and uh, we have a uh, Joe from China as well. Well, now this is a really challenging one for me because I like Bottas a lot as as a as a person, as a driver. I think he did a stand up job at Mercedes, and I think he caught a lot of grief that he was not necessarily fully entitled to. Some of it was, but not all of it. But on the other hand, Joe is a rookie from China. How could you not want that to go well? So I, I'm struggling a bit with this one. But um, if, I, if I tell you who's going to win, I'm going to say, yeah, I think Botas is going to win. But who am I going to be secretly rooting for? I think it might be Joe. So I get what you're saying. And it really is good to have uh, involvement from around the world, you know, truly international world series. But Joe... It, it doesn't look like he's meriting a Formula One drive based on his junior career. And Bottas is an incredibly good driver who found himself probably in the hardest test, or certainly the top two tests you could possibly have in your F1 career to be up against Lewis Hamilton for five series in, seasons in a row and, and has handled himself well, if ultimately didn't hold up to that challenge that the only harder challenge probably in f1 is being max verstappen's teammate especially with the way you know they divvy up uh, development and parts so how 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 can you not root for valtteri bottas to get back on his feet thump a teammate and like show to the world he and and also i'm rooting for him not just to win i'm 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 looking for scorched earth from bottas catman yeah, I'm not entirely sure it's going to be a Alonso versus Van Dorn 21 nil qualifying defeat. Uh, really? Well, well, okay. It, it could be. Yeah. Do you know what? I think Joe will come good towards the end of the end of the season because he took a while to get going in his junior formulae. Um, he only really got close to winning anything. In fact, he only won a title last year. That's the first car racing title he won was the F3 Asia Championship. And he came third in the F2 championship alongside that. But before that in his career, he hadn't, he, he was in F2 for like three years before that. And it, it was like seventh, sixth, and then third. So he's, he gets better as he goes along. So I expect him to mature into the seat. Um, a bit like me, I'm expecting him to have a bit of a, a crashy start, a bit all over the place, a bit like the Sonoda, really flashes of pace and lots of bits of carbon fiber. Uh, for the first sort of half of the season. But uh, much like Spanners, I am rooting for Mr. Bottas because, again, just before he got into Mercedes, he was being mentally tipped as a, like a future world champion. He was being tipped as a real hot prospect. And I think his slightly damaged goods after his mm-hmm. time at Mercedes, I think he had a really good, a good stint and a good crack at the whip. But yeah, a, a lot of people, he's got a lot of the detractors now. So it would be great to see him go in there 
and absolutely prove them wrong and yeah. we might get some more sweary radio messages from him so yeah i'm rooting for him to to repair the damage to well the perceived damage to his yeah. reputation uh, not that there is any well the the perceived damage as well is highlighted by by the fact that he went into hamilton's team it was set up for him you can't imagine that the car was being built around bottas in equal machinery i still think lewis hamilton beats valtteri bottas but you know the the gap is, has been is much exaggerated in the position that he was in and how many times did hamilton get that early advantage in a season and then bottas slotted in and was a team player for the people that he works with you know day in day out and and that that deserves some credit as well because a lot of people would have had a paddy about it and and gone you know gone a gone a little bit you know tantrumy but he he didn't he conducted himself well yeah, and you mentioned that there was all uh, lovey-dovey between Hamilton and Bottas. I think there's the two factors that make a relationship between teammates good. Um, well, or actually can sour the relationship. The first of all is the higher up the grid you are, the harder it is to maintain a nice relationship. And the second is how close they are. So because Bottas wasn't much of a threat to Lewis over the course of a season, they could be quite comfortable together. But you take Rosberg, for example, who was much more of a threat to him, and that soured very quickly. So same with Verstappen and Perez, you know, they're going to be not necessarily uh, fighting over the same bit of track. You know, Perez is definitely the support driver there. So you'll get a good relationship between the two. Okay. And I just want to quickly withdraw my comment uh, where I where I said having a, a paddy. I, I don't think that's a, a correct term to use. I've made that make, mistake before. It's some phrasing I grew up with. So I'm just going to withdraw back from that and apologise. But let's move on uh, up or down the grid. Let's move up or down my tweet, probably. Okay. We're at the we're at the Mercedes. We're at the Mercedes, guys. This is who you're cheering on, not who you think... Uh, uh, is going to win. So I'm going to save mine till last to keep a bit of suspense going on that. So, uh, Catman, who are you cheering on in that teammate battle? Lewis, every single day. I absolutely love Lewis Hamilton. He has been wonderful for his whole career and a lot of many people's viewing experience. And the way he handles himself, particularly in defeat, is just phenomenal. He is a inspiration to everyone and I want my children to model their behavior on that man. He is phenomenal so he is number 1 for me. Oh, all the time. Kyle, who are you cheering on in that battle? Uh slightly different. I'm cheering on George Russell. He's gone into Mercedes, he's got a lot of um he's so you, got hang on. Full... So you're actually you're rooting for in that teammate battle George Russell to perform better than Lewis Hamilton and finish ahead of him. That's your desire for the season. Why are you hurting me, Kyle? Why? <laughs> well, I've I have waxed lyrical about him on um on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire with yourself saying how <laughs> good I think he is. So I've been looking rather silly oh, if no. I wasn't supporting him this oh, year. Oh yeah, I forgot. As a as a local radio person in Cambridgeshire, I should yeah, me too. I also hope George Russell wins. <laughs> okay, <that'll laughs> phew, you saved me there, Kyle. So for me the it not only is it uh, I, I love Lewis Hamilton, but I also think that George Russell is a is very much a, a diamond in the rough so far. He's making a lot mm. of mistakes still, and he's he's not really a rookie anymore. Yes, he's been floundering in the Williams team for the whole of his career in a car that maybe he can't you know push himself in. But just think back to a number of mistakes. So things like you know his Imola twenty twenty crash behind the safety car. Um, you know, in in his uh, debut with the Mercedes team at Bahrain, yes, there was teething issues, but he did make mistakes. He was very fast, but made mistakes. So for me, he, he needs to polish some of those um, errors to be able to take it to Hamilton over the course of a season. Okay, Matt, but who are you supporting? Who will make you, who will make you happy by beating the other? Oh, Hamilton. Because you know Russell's taken oak on seat. That's why. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So you've got some some anti Russell rhetoric there. Um, ultimately, yeah, I think you know I'm not going to be incredibly unhappy with either of those drivers winning. My obviously I'm a massive Lewis Hamilton fan, and I I want to I want to see him get that eighth title because of what happened in Abu Dhabi more than anything. And but he is reaching the end of his his career. And and when you look around the grid at people that you're going to be supporting. 
when the likes of Hamilton and Perez are gone. There's a very exciting new generation. I'm not particularly a Lando Norris fan. You know, so I look at, at Russell of that new crop and, and maybe. But I think, like Catman was talking about with the performance, from a, a fan point of view, I don't feel like he's done the, the thing that has made me go, yeah, yeah, you're my guy. You're my guy in F1. Uh, Kyle, then Catman. We also could be getting a bit of the changing of the guard now as well. Remember yeah. when Lewis come in? I mean, George Russell isn't a rookie now, but he's a but yeah. he's new at the front consistently. So if we see that, it's not you know we know Lewis is in the twilight of his career. Um, but if Lewis goes and wins an eighth world title, I will be a very happy man, and mm-hmm. then he can retire on top and do it now. But equally, I'm going to defend myself slightly here because I can already feel the knives <laughs> heading my way. Um, <laughs> uh, that. That equally, George Russell is probably the future. So if he if he learns from Lewis and eventually gets on top of him, the armor that's going to give him moving forward against mm. the Red Bull machine with with Verstappen, who isn't going anywhere anytime soon, and in, and who is amazing, we want a strong advocacy to go and fight them when Lewis retires. And and I think our knight in shining armor could be George. See, we're not we're not going to get any reprieve from the oh, the British bias. Look at us talking about the changing of the British guard. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be terribly unhappy. I don't think if yeah Hamilton gets his eighth title and then slowly over the course of the next season you see like a handover with uh, you know a Lewis Hamilton taking a more of a, a back seat, looking very much like someone in a a benefit year saying goodbye. Uh, you know, and Russell goes and picks up a title. Uh, but you know that that. Yes, that is probably an indefensible British bias. Catman, save me. Yeah, the, you know, having to carry around that many trophies must slow him down a yeah, little bit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, we've had a, an opinion here from uh, Wright Hasen in uh, the live stream. He says, Russell doesn't feel to me like a nice person, but I might be totally wrong. Uh, I would have said that about Lewis until 2016, and I've completely changed uh, changed my mind. But look, what you have to remember is how old is George Russell? 22, 21, 22? The people at that age, they're not they're not the finished article yet. Generally, F1, all racing drivers, when they're young, they seem precocious, arrogant, entitled, fighty, shouty. And we don't really get to know who they are until they're they're kind of into their early 30s anyway. Yeah, yeah. we need to see what they're like in the bar, really. <laughs> okay. So this is, we should get them out and then that's where the true colours come out. Matt. Well, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm just going to bring this up as an interesting sidelight. Uh, this might be more the year of the rookie because of the massive regulation change, because all of the people who've been driving through the previous eight years of this regulation are going to have a lot of habits to unlearn. And the older you are, the more you depend on those habits to be quick. So, so you, we could see some interesting surprises and some closer battles than we might have anticipated. And I, I just thought I would put that out there now. And the newer recruits, such as Schumacher and uh, Joe, will have driven on 18-inch Pirellis before in Formula 2. They took a, uh, the tyres a few years before F1 did. And that's really, really interesting because we have seen previously, and drivers mentioned this previously, that when there's been a tyre change... Uh, that it can suit the rookies. Think back to 2007, Lewis coming in as a rookie to Formula One. That was just after the tyre war, and it was the first year of the control Bridgestone tyres. And I remember Alonso being quite vocal about the fact that they couldn't break and turn in with any break on like they did in the tyre war. And he said it really favoured the rookies and Lewis because he mm. didn't have to relearn how to drive. So there is a going probably be, there's probably going to be a lot of that this year. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if it plays out. Wow, you said Alonso. So, let's go on to Alpine now. Alonso versus Ocon. Remember, this is not who you think will win. This is who you're cheering on. And, and I'll go first with this because I, I don't know why, and I know I shouldn't, but I do find myself quite often in, in the Alonso fan zone. Uh, and I just I can't help it. It is a destructive relationship i don't know why my f1 fandom is attracted to alonso but i do find myself just cheering him on and getting caught up with it it, it has been this way probably since his his return uh, to formula one and yeah i don't know why i don't know what it is about him but he is uh, he's such a feature in in formula one a, a good a good interesting personality at least i know it's bad for me i think i think alonso might be my my neat whiskey of F1, Kyle. That's what he might be for me. Wow. 
Okay, well, I'm going to go completely the opposite <laughs> and say Ocon. Um, I think it's a pivotal year for him. I think he has to, um, I think he really has to prove himself. I'm not going to talk about him too much because I know Matt is <laughs> eager to talk about Ocon. Ocon and, and yeah, Alonso is an amazing driver. I love seeing him drive, but he's starting to become increasingly poisonous with his little <laughs> oh, comments in the so, press and just his little so digs and his snidey. And it's like, they're man, not little, go. they're not little digs. They're not little digs. Very obvious yeah. digs, but it does seem yeah. to, you know, the L plan does seem to have quite an L attitude. <laughs> yeah. Is what I was sort of calling him. And, and, and he, yeah, he's a great driver and brilliant, but it's the, to, the, the long tradition of the politics behind the scenes and the little snipes where, where I find myself, especially now, when he first come back in the first half of the season, he was relatively quiet and it was okay. And I was really supporting him and it was really good. But now the, the comments are coming in the press and I just think it's a little bit unnecessary. Uh, okay, well, time to move on. No, fine. Matt, who are you supporting in the Alonso versus uh, uh, Ocon battle? Well, you know that I'm going to be support, supporting uh, Ocon in this battle. And I've been a fan of his ever since he pulled off that third in qualifying in the wet at Spa in a force India that had the budget of, oh, I don't know, you know, m my daughter's weekly allowance, as far as I could tell. Um, I think Ocon's an amazingly talented driver. I think it's a shame that he had to spend an entire year out of Formula One. And he had even mentioned that that just even with a year back, he still felt he hadn't fully regained uh, the place where he was when he left, having been forced to sit out that year. Having said that, I think Alonso was, became a bit of, I don't know, an every person in the way that he completely took it to race control with his driving, particularly at like Circuit of the Americas. Um, and it, with regards to track limits and what people were allowed to get away with. And, oh, well, if you're going to let people do that at the start, well, then I'll just do that and gain 19 places. Uh, so I, I can understand why people are a fan of Alonzo. But, but this is, this is a, I'm, I'm always, I'm going to be diehard Ocon Stan here and <laughs> always root for him regardless of how he does. Oh, come on, Catman, balance it out. Be even. Come to Team Alonzo with me. You genuinely don't know where I'm going to go with this. Do I, you? I genuinely have no idea. Okay. Do you know what? Well, Let me guess. Let me guess. I think, I think you're an old sweat. You do like hard driving. I think, I think you're going to be with me uh, in my caveated Alonso stance. Absolutely. I'm full Alonso beans. I love it. Get in. But so, so I would go the last two. So you mentioned about qualifying well in, in wet and tricky conditions. The last two drivers I can seem to remember that did that, apart from Ocon, would be. Stroll and Hulkenberg, so I'm not sure that sits him in amazing company. Um, but for me, I, I absolutely love Alonso on track. I think he's wonderful to watch. His his performance against Hamilton in Hungary last year was absolutely thrilling to watch. And the more of that I can see, the better. All right. Yeah, we split the panel there. Okay, awesome. Uh, two more to go. Uh, let's. Oh, Ferrari. Let's do Ferrari, and then we've got Red Bull. Let's start with Kyle. Which of these two, admittedly both very, very talented drivers, are you supporting this season? I'm going to have to say science. I've becoming a right science fanboy uh, all over the last <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like him. Um, I don't think he's got the raw pace of Leclerc, but... I think he's more sensible in a weird way. He seems yeah, to get yeah, caught up yeah, in less yeah. silly accidents. And I just like him. He seems just like a nice guy. Um, I like both of them. It's a really hard one to choose, but I'm going to have to put, well, I have actually put money on science. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so I'll, 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 I'll go next because, you know, I am the opposite. I think I'm, I, I appreciate science's performance last season, probably the most surprising driver of last season. Uh, there's something about Leclerc that appeals to me. I don't really know much about his background, but he he has this mentality of a fear of it all being taken away. And you hear with his radio messages, it's all very inward. He's, he's He seems to be fighting these personal battles with himself that might well be holding him back. You know, there's, there's almost a lack of self-belief there. Like he constantly is having to punish himself and spur himself on. And I, and I want, I want to see if, if that is the thing that's holding him back, if that can kind of disappear, does he then go on to become, you know, a Schumacher Hamilton type figure 
in in Formula One. Well, Matt, I know I know you're going to say signs here, uh, but there's there's a lot to like about Charles Leclerc. Yeah, actually, if you were to ask me right now who okay. I was supporting, I'd have to say Charlos Le Signs. I don't do you, you cannot do that, you <laughs> fence sitting muddy funkster. No, Signs has been. I have supported Signs since he made Verstappen and his dad throw tantrums in the Alpha Tower garage, uh, which was an Alpha Tower, whatever it was back then, and and to see him come good at Ferrari and actually manage to steal the points away from Leclerc, yeah. who by all rights really should have had it, just brought a, a little tickle of joy to my heart. And I, I agree with Kyle. The thing that uh, appeals to me about Signs is that he's not the fastest. But yet somehow he comes out ahead so very, very often. He's got this other thing that happens in the races, and it's just a joy to watch. So I've got my fingers crossed for him to pull it off at least one more season. That said, Ferrari are winning the public relations battle with these two drivers yeah. because there's not a lot to dislike about either of them. No, absolutely. Catman. Yep. Science all the way. I think oh. he's he's been phenomenal ever since he started. Leclerc again is is very much like a Russell character for me. He's he's still unpolished. Kyle mentioned lots of mistakes. Yeah, he he fluffs it under pressure, thinking, you know, losing that Monaco pole last year, for example. Yeah, you know, that's a big one. You can't be doing that if you're going for a title. Well, no, hang on, just just to, just to head off some emails there. He he got the pole by crashing, but then it was it was on the warm up lap that the they realised the suspension had gone. So he effectively lost the pole, but he did have pole position going into going into sunday so um, the last one we're going to cover today is is red bull so remember separate this from his battle with uh, lewis hamilton if you're thinking about verstappen out of these two drivers who do you want to see getting the results and coming out on top uh, at the end of the season so it's an interesting insight to see uh, my panel's opinions on these two drivers let's start with let's start with kyle because i don't actually really know where you sit uh, with Verstappen, but of these two drivers, who who would make you happy to to see do well? That's a an impossibly difficult question. Um, I would like Perez to do well, but I'm going to say Verstappen. I like I'm trying to be realistic here as well, and I just don't. It's I just, not who you think will think, win. It's who you want. Who are you cheering for? I'll stick with Verstappen. I've stuck to my guns, and I will stick to Verstappen. I want to see another epic fight at the front. I'll back you up, Kyle. I am cheering for Verstappen as well. What I'm cheering for and what I really want to see is I want to see that little edge taken off. If you give him 99% of Verstappen, he's brilliant, and I really love watching him. I don't want that extra little thing that came out last year that wasn't the best but if i get 99% verstappen i'll be ecstatic i love that guy when he's on form and driving amazingly he can do things that nobody else apart from maybe lewis can do okay fine no that's fine that's okay no no, no, no i asked the question i asked so um that's good we're learning yeah we're never coming back on are we we're learning about we're learning out the, we're learning about the panel matt well you know if i'm being honest I was astonished that Kyle would, would would go for Verstappen, being a fan of the drama, because what I would look forward to is how he responded, much like Hamilton did, to losing to Button, to losing to Perez this season. Because frankly, I don't think Red Bull's going to be in the fight in the same way this season and that they were last season, no matter what anyone says about how clever the rear end of the car looks. On the other hand, I'm torn because I can see how much it hurts you were I to choose Verstappen. So it's really, it's kind of a tough choice that here, can't but be I'm going to go, I'm going to go for Perez. Okay. Thank you. For the same reason I went for signs, but also because I want to see Verstappen have to react to that mm. and how he deals with it. Cause up until now, anyone who's given him a hard time has been shipped out. And I want to see what happens if, if, if we're going to stick true. around and this is going to be a real pairing. Sorry, who gave Verstappen a hard time? You're talking Sainz, about Gasly again. Oh, Ricardo. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Technically Vettel-ish. Yeah. So I think no surprise to anybody listening that I'll be cheering on 
uh, Sergio Perez in that Red Bull teammate battle. But for me, that's like a career thing, very much like Matt and, and Ocon. And we've seen Perez kind of kind of have his shot in a declining McLaren and then uh, and then for that to, to go by very quickly. But then to, to watch him going up against... You know some some of the top drivers that we've seen in F1 and some of the most popular drivers as well, Hulkenberg, Ocon, and, and and being able to to take it to those drivers to get just that unexpected shot uh, at Red Bull when it looked to be a an F1 less 2021 and then returning to say Williams in 2022 to then have him at, at one of the top teams is just incredible and and there was a, an eight race period during last season after a really promising start where it just all looked like it was going wrong and it, there was just a dearth of uh, of results. But he showed enough, I think, with the racing. He certainly showed enough to Red Bull to get that contract, uh, which he then consequently rewarded Red Bull by having eight awful results in a row. But it feels like there is something there and it feels like Perez came into F1 to be a top driver and teams have hired him to be a top driver people have backed him financially to be a top driver and i and i don't think it's it's a foregone conclusion that he can't take it to max verstappen this year and get it close and i'll certainly be cheering him on he's a, he's a likable driver he's a talented driver and i think he's got something a little bit different i think he's got a little bit of a racing brain that can give him an advantage on on certain days catman then kyle yeah, I'm so pleased for him that he's got that second shot at a top team. I say top team. When he went to McLaren, they were very yeah. much on the wane. And he was a young, hot-headed guy up against an experienced button, and, and they had their clashes. But, you know, I, he's a wonderful person to have in that second seat at Red Bull. He's he's quick. He's a, a tyre master. And he's, you know, I'm really pleased to see him sneaking in the results. So I think it's great. He just needs to sort out his qualifying, and he'll be there. Kyle. I'd like to caveat mine. Like, um, I really do, really, really do want no. Perez to do well. No, it's but too I'm late. Trying to be no. realistic, and I don't think there is even a remote trying possibility. <laughs> I don't, but I just don't think there's remote possibility he can get near Verstappen, particularly in a Red Bull. I just don't even think that's even a remote possibility. So how can I cheer for something that I think is clearly going to be impossible? I, I think at, at Red Bull they do back a winning horse, so. In in a in in that in that rare possibility where the car just happens to suit Perez in the first five or six races and gets a nose ahead, I I think you'll start to see that that tide turn. I you know they do have a chosen driver and they are willing to to flip flop. They flip flopped on Vettel and I think they would flip flop on Verstappen over the course of a season if Perez got his nose ahead. I disagree. I think they um, back the horse that they hand reared, and they always will do. Yeah, that still sits uncomfortably with uh, with the Red Bull management that Perez is doing so well after um, Gasly and Albon, their own you know golden children, uh, didn't make it. They've had to draft it in from elsewhere. It's not not their not their way, is it? And that takes us to the end of the driver lineups that we we know for 2022. I've really enjoyed that segment, guys, and it's so good just to get an insight into to where your F1 fandom is and there's always a lot of discussions obviously about which drivers will do well and why and who is performing i do find it interesting to know where our fan allegiance goes to so thank you so much for doing that um and of course we'll be looking forward to the bahrain test when's that matt oh i don't know a couple of weeks all right good we've got lots of content coming up on uh, missed apex podcast and uh, because uh, we are ramping everything up now as we get to march so there'll be a lot more patron content as well and some midweek content which we've taken a break from over the off season i have really enjoyed keeping up our regular drumbeat of sunday shows but it's felt excessive with the, the lack of news and stuff happening to also have midweek content but our aim is to return to six shows a month like we do in the regular season coming from march and matt and i are going to get together and do a, a week patron live stream probably on a, a tuesday evening something like that if you want to support us on patreon join our live chat and get that extra content patreon.com forward slash missed apex and, and come and join us in the slack group and hang out as well do follow my panel at catman f1 on twitter uh, he's he's a vet so you can bug him for vet stuff and and vet, you don't tweet much about animals and vet stuff though catman you, you could take give us your hot takes on cat care 
I don't want to get fired. I'd rather oh. write my hot takes F1 based. Aren't you the boss of the place? I'm, I'm the boss, but I can still get I can still get uh, ousted out of my profession. Oh, okay, fair enough. Okay, uh, but uh, Kyle doesn't appear to care about getting ousted from anywhere. You can follow him at Kyle Power F1, and you don't mind the odd hot take at all, do you, uh, Kyle? Every now and then, if it's usually before midday and I might be slightly hungover, yeah, I've definitely usually got a few hot takes. <laughs> Excellent. So do follow Kyle there. Follow Matt at MattPT55. Definitely hot takes on your Twitter feed, Matt. Yeah, I, I generally people are not in much doubt about what I think about things if you follow me on Twitter. So apologies for that if all you <laughs> wanted was cars. Follow Matt's wife as well at A Weaver Writes. She writes books and buying a uh, Amanda's books will help Matt achieve his ultimate aim of not working putting your feet up and having a ferrari uh, yeah these all sound like good things to me so uh get to buying people follow the show at missed apex f1 we've got a facebook page as well search for missed apex podcast follow me i'm the best one at spanners ready and richard ready on facebook until we see you next which could be sunday uh all i'd say to you is work hard be kind and have fun this was missed apex podcast mm-hmm.